So we'll start typing. Yeah, good evening. Uh, good evening to all who join online. Uh, I'm Dr. Padma Gunratna, President, Sri Lanka Medical Association. Uh, we have joined here today for the SLMA Young Members Forum. Uh, the Sri Lanka Medical Association, which is a fairly vast organization, is with a versatile young members who are interested in forming the SLMA Young Members Forum. And uh, they have paid their interest today for a very important aspect of Sri Lankan treasures. Out of many treasures in Sri Lanka, our elephants are sort of one of the most, I mean, it takes sort of fairly high place uh, in the list of treasures. The cost of conflict of human and elephant health to Sri Lanka is vast. Uh, the uh, cost of human and elephant health for Sri Lankans is so vast to an extent that over the years, we have lost a good number of our elephants. So this is a major problem for Sri Lanka and there are no problems without solutions. I'm glad that our young members, the SLMA Young Members Forum paid attention today and they became concerned of this problem. Uh, and I think that is what is most important for young members that for them to be concerned of our environment and to take actions to preserve the environment. So the, uh, let me uh, invite the moderators of this uh, presentation that will be made by a very eminent speaker, Dr. Preeti Viraj Fernandu, senior scientist, conservationist, the chair, Center for Conservation and Research. We are glad to have you here. And then I welcome all the people who joined online for this forum. And let me invite the moderators Dr. Sankar Randini Kumara and Dr. Sajit Idrisingha to continue with the proceedings of the uh, uh, forum. Sankar, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, madam. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to have you all for the second webinar on the environment held by the SLMA Young Members Forum. Uh, considering our social responsibility, one of the objectives of the SLMA Young Members Forum is promoting environmental health and conservation in Sri Lanka. So our second webinar we have organized again, aiming this objective. Uh, I'm Sankar, the chair of the Young Members Forum and uh, our, one of our uh, conveners Dr. Sajid Tedri Singh also, also uh, joining me for, uh, for moderation. Uh, so Sri Lanka as a paradise with a rich wildlife also has this majestic mammal species elephants. Elephants are usually admired by people, but unfortunately human elephant conflict has become a long dragging issue, which has become detrimental to both parties humans as well as elephants. So today we have one of the best speakers to talk about this issue, how this has uh, become a health problem, not only uh, just a health problem, it's a national problem, I think. So uh, uh, our speaker is Dr. Prithviraj Fernando, MBBS, MSc, PhD. Dr. Prithviraj Fernando qualified as a medical doctor from the North Kalamu Medical College, but decided to pursue a career in conservation biology later. He obtained an MSc and PhD from the University of Oregon, studying elephants. Thereupon, he joined Columbia University, New York, where he conducted research on Asian elephants and Javan rhinos. In 2004, he returned to Sri Lanka and set up the Center for Conservation and Research of which he is the chairman. Dr. Prithviraj has worked on Asian elephants and human elephant conflict across their range. 
Dr. Fernando is a member of the Asian Elephant Specialist Group and a research associate of the Smithsonian Institution USA and has received the Whitley Award for Nature Conservation and Sri Lankan Presidential Awards for Scientific Excellence. So with this biography, I think uh, he becomes one of the best persons to talk about this issue. Uh, Dr. Prithviraj, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Sankar. And uh, I'd first like to thank the uh, SLMA Young Members uh, Forum for inviting me to uh, talk to you about this issue. Um, so let me just uh, go on to screen share. Human elephant conflict is a complex subject. So today I will give you an overview of the conflict, what we have done and what we can do for the future. The human elephant conflict is a conflict between people and elephants. People suffer in many ways due to the conflict, mainly due to crop raiding by elephants. And one of the main crops that are raided by elephants are paddy fields. However, when farmers somehow safeguard their crop, harvest it and come and store it in their houses, mm. the elephants come and break the houses to get at the stored paddy. And in this process, sometimes they injure people and sometimes kill people. If we look at the annual human deaths due to the conflict, we can see that the deaths are going up year by year. The highest number of deaths recorded so far was in 2019 when 121 deaths were recorded. Sri Lanka has the second highest number of animal human deaths due to human elephant conflict in the whole world. In addition to injury and death from elephants, people also suffer in indirect ways due to the human elephant conflict. When people farm in areas with elephants and the elephants are raiding crops, they have to guard their crops. So as a result, the farmers have to spend the whole day doing their agricultural activity and then they have to spend the whole night staying up and guarding the crops. So this leads to lots of rest, lots of sleep and often the farmland is somewhere away from the house. So the man has to go to the farmland to guard the crops while the, his wife and family are sleeping at home. And so this leads to a number of social issues. There can also be lost opportunity costs. If there were no elephants, you could cultivate any crop that you want. But in areas with elephants, there are certain crops like manioc or watermelon that might be very profitable, but you cannot grow because of the elephants. So lost opportunity costs also increase poverty. Additionally, this leads to a lot of fear because whenever the farmer is in the field, he is thinking about the house, whether the elephant could be coming and breaking the house and putting his family in the danger. And vice versa, the people at home are thinking about the father in the chena alone in the night. An elephant might attack him, going to the chena, coming from the chena. So these people live in an environment of fear which leads to chronic stress and attendant issues. Elephants also suffer in many ways due to the conflict. This baby's leg is cut due to a snare. The wire is still probably there and he is going to get gangrene and die. This baby's trunk is cut due to a snare. Snares are not set for elephants but to obtain bushmeat. But very often, young elephants get caught to these snares and their trunks 
and their legs get cut and injured and in many cases they end up dying. So this baby can't drink water because of her trunk is cut. So finally she tries to drink water by putting her face in the water. One of the leading causes of elephant deaths in Sri Lanka is hakka patas or jaw bombs. This is a Sri Lankan invention that has now become very common. An explosive device is secreted in a fruit or a watermelon or pumpkin or some such thing and when an elephant or any animal bites on it, it explodes inside the mouth shattering the jaws, hence the name Hakkapatas or jawbreaker or jaw bomb and also destroying all the soft tissue, the tongue, shattering the teeth and these animals die an agonizing death, starving and being dehydrated till they die. Elephants fall into agriculture wells. Agriculture wells are usually constructed by some institution as an aid to farmers. How difficult is it to put up a fence around these wells or build a wall around it? But we don't do it. Increasingly, elephants are electrocuted. In this case, a farmer collect, connected the mains line electricity, the mains grid electricity to a barbed wire fence and four elephants died that day in an instant. Elephants get shot. And if you look at annual elephant deaths reported in the country, we can see that is also going up year by year and again the highest number was recorded in 2019 with 405 elephant deaths. Sri Lanka records the highest number of elephant deaths annually in the whole world. So we have the second highest number of human deaths and the highest number of elephant deaths in the world giving us the highest level of human elephant conflict in the whole world. Now we have been trying to mitigate this conflict for decades. The main methods used to mitigate the conflict are translocation, which is conducted in the case of an elephant breaking houses regularly or killing a person. Then there are usually public protests and the wildlife department will try to go and capture that elephant, put him in a truck and take him to a faraway protected area and release him. Invariably, these are all adult males. In elephants, there is a very distinct social structure. The females and the young live in groups and the males, when they come into puberty, about 15 years of age, they leave the herd and after that they are single. And it is mainly some of these adult males that are responsible for most of the incidents of housebreaking or human deaths. Elephant drives are conducted to clear a large area of elephants, usually in relation to mega irrigation projects. So elephants would be driven from hundreds of square kilometers and these drives take maybe months or years to complete. And then we've been putting up electric fences on the boundaries of protected areas. But with all these things being done for decades, human elephant conflict is only increasing day by day. And as a result, now we have resorted to distributing what are called elephant thunders, which are huge firecrackers free of charge to farmers. Currently, the government spends more than 100 million rupees a year distributing these firecrackers to farmers. Now clearly, with all these things, human-elephant conflict has gone up. So basically, these human-elephant conflict mitigation methods do not work and in fact, some of them cause increased spread of the conflict as well as intensification of the conflict. We don't have time today to go into the details of that, but we can do that 
at a later date. Now if you look at these activities, translocation, elephant drives, electric fences and elephant thunders. All these are done to mitigate the problem that people have. Although elephants also have a problem, they do not address the problems that elephants have. But they are not successful even in addressing the problems that people have. But what about their impact on elephants? In fact, these methods cause intensive harassment of elephants. As a result, elephants live their entire lives in fear, which obviously have psychological impacts on them. They cause loss of habitat, loss of resources and access to resources to elephants. They can cause loss of range and they cause local extinction of elephants. So although we say human-elephant conflict mitigation, what we mean is mitigating the impacts of human-elephant conflict on people and in fact we cause further conflict for elephants by our mitigation methods that we have adopted. The blueprint for what the uh, plan of action was laid down in the 1940s by a committee appointed by the government. This committee suggested that elephants be limited to the areas shown in green on this map and they were to be driven into those areas through these corridors that are shown in blue. But in defense of that committee, they realized that this was something they were suggesting, not based on data. And they also suggested that studies be done to assess the effectiveness of these methods. But for more than 60 years, we have blindly followed these guidelines without doing the studies that were recommended. But now we have done these studies and now we can understand what is going wrong. This is a results of a survey that was done recently. The survey is based on a 25 square kilometer grid, that is the national grid, that is one of these small squares. In the red areas, there are people that are resident. In the green areas, there are no resident people. So in Sri Lanka, in 18% of the country, there are no resident people. These are all protected areas, either under the wildlife department or the forest department. But in 82% of Sri Lanka, there are resident people. Now, if we look at where the elephants are, there are elephants in the green areas, that is the areas without resident people as well as in the yellow areas. So together that represents 62% of the country. There are no elephants in the red areas, that is the southwest quarter of Sri Lanka and the hill country and the Jaffna Peninsula and some small areas in the dry zone which are basically uh, intensively developed areas. But the rest of the country, which amounts to 62%, there are elephants. And since there are no resident people in 18% of the country, there are elephants and people living in the same landscape in 44% of the country, almost half the country. Now, if our objective is to put all the elephants that are sharing the land with people. That is, if you take elephant range, that is 70% of elephant range. 
into where there are no people that is only 30% of elephant range that is like trying to put a jug of water into a glass that is already full it simply cannot be done and if you keep trying to do that you end up creating a huge mess now clearly these main activities that we have been undertaking for decades to mitigate the conflict are not working but also if you look at traditional crop protection and some of these activities such as chasing elephants which we do on a daily basis elephant drives these are all confrontational elephants are the largest animals on land they are very powerful animals now when you confront such an animal and act aggressively towards it it also reciprocates with aggression we say that even the worm turns but an elephant turns much quicker and if and becomes aggressive towards you and the first day an elephant act, acts aggressively towards people who are harassing it the people will either run away or get killed and when an elephant experiences that from that day onwards that's going to reinforce his aggression so this is how we create killer elephants there is no gain for an elephant in killing a person but elephants kill people because that elephant is scared that the person will do him harm based on his past experience so we are the ones who are actually creating these animals now among the many methods that have been tried out to prevent elephants from raiding crops live fences chili fences beehive fences and so on the only thing that is effective is electric fencing currently the wildlife department has put up more than 4500 kilometers of electric fencing in sri lanka currently they are putting up another 1500 kilometers this year now with all that human elephant conflict is increasing day by day so does that mean that electric fencing is also useless electric fencing is only a tool whether it works or not depends on how you use it and how have we been using it most of our fences 80 90% of these fences that have been put up have elephants on both sides 60 plus percent of these fences are between wildlife department and forest department areas there is a fence there's forest on both sides and there are elephants on both sides this map depicts an area in the northwest of the country the orange lines denote electric fences put up by the wildlife department on the upper left hand corner is the tabbova fence and on the right side is the kalle palle kale rasvera fence now the elephants in the northwest are supposed to be inside these fenced in areas now this is some tracking data of the elephants in these areas so these are elephants that have been tracked with the wildlife department using gps satellite collars the different colors denote different elephants males or herds but you can clearly see that the ranging of these elephants has absolutely no bearing to these electric fences it's not that there are no elephants in the areas with the electric fences there are more elephants there but these are the ones that have been collared and tracked 
this is the southern part of the country. The large area in the middle is the Lunuga Mehra National Park, which is contiguous with the Yala Protected Area Complex. The green line on the border is the electric fence around the protected areas, the Wildlife Department protected areas. Above that, the two colors denote GPS uh, collared elephants, females from two herds that were collared. So this is the Kudawaya area. And there are more than 100 elephants living in this area. But these elephants actually cannot go into the park because of this electric fence. The area they occupy is mostly under the forest department. But there is no barrier between these elephants and the developed area around them. Similarly, south of the Lunugamera National Park in the Sella Kataragam area. There are about 50 elephants in that area. Again, this denotes a herd that has been collared. And these animals again cannot go into the park because of the fence and no barrier between them and the surrounding developed area. Now, what is the issue about putting up fences like this inside the forest? So if we say the dark green area is the wildlife department area. The forest department area is the lighter green area. Usually the forest department areas are more exterior and the wildlife areas are more interior. So the forest department areas are somewhat like buffer zones. Now if there are elephants that are using both these areas and then we put up a fence between them, between the wildlife and the forest department area inside the forest, we are cutting their home range in half. That means the elephants that get marooned on the wrong side of the fence either have to break the fence and go in and use again their normal home range this side and that side of the fence or else they have to now stay limited to whatever area they can use in the forest department area which is half their home range which means they cannot survive or else they have to look for new resources and go into developed areas which are adjacent to the forest department areas. So fences like this inside forest actually push elephants into more and more conflict. Now if we think why are we putting up these fences? Isn't it to protect people, their property, their crops, their lives? So if you want to protect something, shouldn't your method of protection be aligned with where protection is needed? So shouldn't these fences be where protection is needed, that is the boundary of the developed area? Secondly, who should be putting up these fences? Should not the people who are faced with this conflict, who suffer from it, do something about it? Shouldn't they construct these fences? Shouldn't they maintain these fences? Shouldn't the agencies who are responsible for people's welfare, be it the divisional secretariats, be it development agencies like the irrigation department, Maha Valley, agrarian services, shouldn't those agencies help these people put up and maintain these fences? Why is the Wildlife Conservation Department putting up electric fences to protect people? This does not make sense. However, the highest level of conflict is when a person gets killed. Even if we don't take adequate and appropriate steps to prevent conflict when we do development, one would think that we at least are responsible towards our lives. But are we? This is a day in the southern part of the country. There are more than 60 elephants across the road. Huge males, adult females, young ones, juveniles. 
and these two youngsters are riding a little chelly through the herd. Very brave and very stupid. If any one of these elephants turned because it was scared and by accident knocked them, they would fall and probably get stepped on and lose their lives. And then of course we would burn tires, block the roads and protest against elephants and the wildlife department and the government. Okay, so clearly what we have been doing to mitigate the conflict has not been working. How we behave in areas with elephants only increases the problems. So how do we move forward from here? Firstly, we have to accept the fact that we cannot limit all elephants to protected areas. We cannot put a jug of water into a glass that is already full. Now if we accept that, then we can move forward. The main approach that we can adopt to effectively mitigate the conflict is community-based electric fencing and creating awareness among people. We can use electric fences logically to protect what needs to be protected. So we can protect villages if there is a problem, a particular village, a particular settlement has a problem of elephants entering the village or the settlement, breaking houses in search of stored grain or raiding the home gardens. The people in that village or settlement can get together and construct an electric fence to protect themselves. So these are community built, community based electric fences. Currently there are about 50 functioning fences such as this in Sri Lanka and some of them have been active for more than 12 years and are still very effective. So these community based village electric fences are there only to prevent elephants entering the area that is being used by people and where people are living. They are not boundary markers. So they do not enclose land that is not currently used by the people. The people themselves decide where the fence goes and they also construct and maintain it. And this model has been very effective. Similarly, Raiding of paddy is a huge problem, but paddy fields are cultivated only three and a half months of the year. So if you put up a permanent electric fence around a paddy field, who's going to maintain it when the paddy field is not cultivated? Some paddy fields are cultivated two seasons of the year, some only one, and some are not cultivated at all in some years because there's not enough rain. And when the paddy field is not cultivated, why should a farmer go and spend time trying to maintain a fence when there's nothing to be protected? So we have piloted a mobile or seasonal paddy field electric fence that again has proved to be very successful. Currently there are more than 30 such fences operative in Sri Lanka, some of them operative for more than 10 years now. So that is 10 to 20 seasons of cultivation. Every paddy tract in Sri Lanka has a farmer society and the farmers can put up one of these fences within a day around most paddy tracks. And once the fence is put up, they do the cultivation. 
The fence is again just like the village fence is on the boundary of the paddy field. And the fence protects the paddy field through the cultivation season. And the day they harvest the paddy, the farmers roll up the fence and take it back home with them and store it at home till the next season of cultivation. So these community-based fences have been very effective. They are cost-effective and they are very successful. So this is the way to go. But then the question is, who can implement this at the scale that is appropriate, considering that there are millions of people living in 44% of the country with elephants. That is why agencies that have a network among people, that have a relationship with people, that have authority over the people, such as the Divisional Secretariat and the development agencies such as the Irrigation Department, Mahavali, Agrarian Services, these agencies have to be the ones that are working with people to do this community fencing. The Wildlife Conservation Department cannot do this. So if we make this paradigm change, if we change the way we weave human-elephant conflict and how we try to mitigate it. We can turn human-elephant conflict into human-elephant coexistence. In 2020, His Excellency the President appointed a committee to develop a national action plan for the mitigation of human elephant conflict. The committee consisted of a number of scientists and heads of relevant departments, district secretaries, and this committee sat and deliberated and developed a very comprehensive scientific action plan based on data and information that is now available to us. But unfortunately, so far, this has not been implemented. Instead, we are still running behind the mirage of putting a jug of water into a glass already full. Thank you. If there are any questions, uh, we can actually uh, somehow ask it from uh, Dr. Prithviraj. We have uh, Dr. Prithviraj, are you here? Yes, Dr. Prithviraj. Yeah. Ah, yes. Uh, there's one question. Uh, mm -hmm. First question here. Uh, how many elephants uh, die per year, uh, usually, according to the statistics? Um, it used to be about 250, uh, also in the, over the past 10 years, but uh, in the last two, three years, it has gone up tremendously. And 2019, 409 elephants died, and 2020, I think 300 and uh, something elephants died. Uh, uh, what is your view on using bees? Uh, this has been tried, I think, in several places. Bees, honey bees, uh, as uh, a way of uh, sort of chasing away the elephants. Yeah, um, that has been tried in Africa and uh, the, they claim uh, some success with that. 
but um, that has been tried in several places in Asia, including Sri Lanka, and it has completely failed. And uh, in fact, the person who started this uh, bee fences in Africa, Dr. Lucy King, had a student in Sri Lanka who tried it out, uh, but it just didn't work. Uh, so there are a number of reasons. One is that the Asian honeybees, perhaps not so uh, aggressive as the African bees. In addition, uh, we don't have enough flowers throughout the year to support a large number of beehives. And also beekeeping is not an uh, easy thing. So there are lots of issues and that has completely failed everywhere in Asia, including in Sri Lanka. And one of the methods tried out was uh, planting uh, lime or orange trees. What about that? Again, it's something, I mean, people have been talking about the biofences planting trees as a barrier. And again, this is not something practical. Um, if you have tried to grow anything, you will know that plants die from, so maybe there's too much sun, there's not enough sun, there's too much water, not enough water, the, it's a rocky area, all kinds of reasons plants die. So it's almost impossible to grow a barrier which is many kilometers long. You might be able to do it with a lot of effort in a very small area of maybe a hundred meters or something like that. But any barrier for elephants has to be many kilometers in extent. And again, it has not been successful growing these biofences anywhere in the world. What is the birth rate of elephants? Now, we know about the, the, the death rates of, out of the human-elephant conflict. Any idea about the birth rate? Um, actually, we don't know. Uh, we don't have that kind of information. We have some information for particular populations. For example, we have been conducting research in the Yara National Park for more than uh, 25 years now. So we have data for such populations. So it varies a lot. Um, elephants have, a, have the longest gestation period of any mammal, that is 22 months, and they suckle the baby for another two, two and a half years. So a female gives birth only once in about four and a half, five years. So the maximum birth rate recorded for elephants is about 5% per year, but in most cases, it's not even close to that. And what we are seeing is, for example, in Yala and many of our national parks where elephants have been put in and fenced in, the birth rates are actually decreasing, it's negative. So um, we don't have data to say what the birth rate is for the whole of Sri Lanka, but particular populations, uh, they may increase at about one or 2% uh, per year, but also other populations, they are decreasing at similar rates or even greater rates. Right, Sajid, uh, a, a few more questions are there, you can continue. Yeah, uh, now, one question is there about these elephant corridors. Uh, is there, one person is asking, is there any scientific way to redirect these elephants through uh, these elephant corridors? because these elephant corridors are being blocked due to several re reasons. Any scientific way of uh, redirecting elephants? Well, um, again, the issue of elephant corridors, um, when we talk about corridors, elephant corridors particularly, people think of a protected area, two protected areas, which is connected by a corridor. But this doesn't apply to elephants and particularly Asian elephants at all. So there are what are called, what could be called corridors in an area that elephants use, which are basically, for example, there may be one place that they can cross a road. So that would be a corridor. So that kind of corridor, you can only determine by radio tracking elephants. In Sri Lanka, we have tracked about 
close upon 100 elephants together with the wildlife department. So in some areas, we have that kind of information where we can actually identify where these elephants maybe cross a road or cross uh, uh, some human areas. And those then should be preserved as corridors if you, if, because if you block them, the conflict will increase. But the what people traditionally think of as elephant corridors are really not something real. It's something uh, that we believe is there. And, but uh, the elephants really don't know about these corridors. And they are, for example, some of the corridors that are, have been even uh, declared and fenced, there are elephants inside the corridor and both outside above and below the corridors. So when we talk about elephant corridors, the only way to identify corridors is through radio tracking elephants. And that can be done. But unfortunately, to do that, we have to collar a large number of elephants, but um, that doesn't seem to be possible anymore in Sri Lanka. Right. Any uh, electronic signals that we can use as a repellent? Uh, since these uh, B fences are not uh, effective, so can't we use uh, something similar that is used in, in the whatever the sound waves that are used in Africa as an electrical uh, or the electronic impulse, the sound waves to uh, as a repellent for our elephants? The problem with anything like that, so people have tried to use sound, people have tried to use um, light, uh, flashing lights, very uh, strong lights. Uh, the, the, the elephant firecrackers, the elephant thunders are based on sound. So that if your elephant thunder is like a, a firecracker that is about one foot long and it goes off like a bomb. But elephant, the problem with elephants is that they are pretty intelligent and very soon they get used to any of these methods. They realize that this is only just a lot of sound or only just a, a light that doesn't harm them. So as a result, initially, when you try out something new, it invariably works because the elephants are not used to that. But after a while, the elephants learn that this is not harmful and then it loses its effectiveness. So there's no sound that you can use that will repel elephants and will work for any length of time. If you use a sound that elephants are unfamiliar with, they will probably run away. But after a week, after a month, or after a year, they will be back. And after that, it's not going to work. Dr. Prithviraj, what is the summary of this action plan or the national policy that was worked on uh, last year? What is the summary? And what is the summary uh, of that? The resolutions uh, yeah. proposed? The main focus of the plan is that we need to change the approach to human elephant conflict mitigation. Instead of trying to put all the elephants in the protected areas, which has failed miserably, that proposes to directly protect the people by doing community-based fence, electric fencing and doing that through agencies that are responsible for people's welfare such as Division of Secretariats, Agrarian Services, Irrigation, and such departments, which work with people. That is the main um, change that the action plan proposes. And in addition to that, it uh, goes into a very uh, wide range of uh, other issues that are connected. Uh, Dr. Fernando, another question is there. Uh, people have tried several things to mitigate and con uh, mitigate the conflict from human side. What options are available and have been tried from elephant sites? Um, I'm not too sure what that question is. So basically why the things that we have tried have failed is mostly because we have not considered the elephant side of that. We have not really thought about elephant behavior. 
how elephants respond to what we are doing. And we have not taken into consideration the needs of the elephants when we design these mitigation methods. That is why they have failed. So if yes, if we actually consider elephant behavior and ecology in designing these uh, mitigation methods, I think they will be much more successful. And that is what has been tried, that we have tried to do in the uh, National Action Plan. Uh, Dr. Penner, uh, now this might be a very silly question. Now, do we have enough elephants or we are lacking of elephants or uh, we have over excess of elephants in Sri Lanka? Uh, that's a very important question, I would say. It all depends on your point of view. Yeah. So, a um, lot of people think that there are too many elephants in Sri Lanka and that we should reduce the elephant numbers. And so that kind of thinking is based on the idea that there are too many elephants, they don't have enough to eat and that's why they are raiding crops. But this is not true. It is, uh, that idea is not based on elephant uh, ecology and behavior. The problem with elephants is that elephants are attracted to crops, particularly male elephants, because they are much better than anything in the forest. So however much food there is in the forest, if you grow crops and the elephants can access it, they will access it. So the, you cannot reduce the conflict by reducing the elephants. A perfect example of that is the Singharaja situation where there are only two elephants there, but it, there's a lot of conflict around that area. So if you want to uh, manage the conflict by reducing elephants, you basically have to get rid of all the elephants. And that again, uh, cannot be done easily, nor do we want to do that, I think, as a country. So basically, I think we have the number of elephants that we have. And if we can protect the people and the crops and their property, I think then we can manage the conflict with the number of elephants that we have. And the elephants will decide how many elephants can uh, be in Sri Lanka. Uh, there's a question about uh, elephant fences. Uh, the, this says there are many villages in Batiklo which needs uh, which, which uh, need electric fences. Farmers there cannot afford for the question is, are these community fences are government projects? How how to get a fence? That's the main problem, I think. Well, um, I think again that's a, a very good question. Um, yes, that is the way to go. So if there is a village that has a problem with elephants coming into the village and raiding the home gardens, breaking houses then if the villagers get together and put up a fence around them, then that problem will be solved. Unfortunately, currently there is no government um, project uh, uh, or government initiative to do these uh, community protection fences. Currently still the government focus is on putting up fences on the boundaries of protected areas and trying to put all the elephants in there. So this is, I think, what needs to change. And so if fences could be provided for such people that require fences through the divisional secretariats, and if they are, prote if they are to protect their paddy fields and crops, if fences could be provided to them through the agrarian services, irrigation department, agriculture department, then I think we can solve this problem. So I think that is the way to go. But currently there is no such program. There has a hilarious question, but I think this is very true. How many human deaths could be attributed to alcohol? Do you think farmers should refrain from an evening drink so that elephants can walk around freely? Actually, the uh, then the, so to bottom line is 
all these deaths are they due to uh, confront confrontation or they uh, were they due to uh, sort of uh, the, the innocent people and the elephant came and killed them well, any idea about that yeah so yes i mean alcohol is a big problem a big part of this issue and a uh, lot of the people who get killed by elephants are drunk so if you are drunk and walking about in an area with elephants you are basically i think asking for trouble but yes there are some deaths that are accidental there are some deaths which are due to confrontation and the elephant reciprocating so basically if you think about it and there is no gain for an elephant in killing a person it's not like a man eating tiger or lion or something like that so the elephant will kill a person because the elephant is scared that the person will do some injury to the elephant and so that is based on the past experience the elephant has had with people so unfortunately as i said because all our crop guarding all our elephant drives elephant chasing which is done on a daily basis is confrontational so when elephants are subject to aggression like that more and more elephants think that people are all the time out to kill them and sometimes those elephants will turn around and then that will result in the death of a person so the best way to break this uh, sort of vicious circle is to adopt non confrontational methods and the best non confrontational method that is available to us is electric fencing but electric fencing again is a tool so like any other tool it works only if it is used properly unfortunately we have not been using it properly and the proper way to use that is through community based fencing uh the question another question is it cost effective to maintain cultivation by an electric fence how can a villager maintain electric fence yeah i agree so if you actually look at the value of the crops in some cases the cost of the fence might be uh more than the value of the crops but then again and also most people uh, like in the earlier question most people cannot afford these fences because electric fencing is fairly expensive currently the community fences cost about 5 or 600000 per kilometer the government built fences along the protected area boundaries cost more than a million per kilometer but again what value can you put on the life of a person so if a electric fence protects the village and the home gardens where the cultivation is done then it not only protects the crops but also the value of the the valuable lives of people similarly a person is cultivating a paddy field and if there is no fence his life is also at risk but in most cases when you consider things like paddy fields it is cost effective the current cost of cultivating one acre of paddy is runs to about 40000 rupees per season for each farmer and the cost he would have to bear to put up a fence is actually much less than that and a fence can be used many many years uh, repetitively so they are it is actually cost effective this question uh, okay i'll ask the why not give permission to a farmer to use a weapon at least when they are they are, when their life is threatened what do you think well in the past few years there have been initiatives by the uh, successive governments including this government of distributing firearms to farmers that has not helped at all in fact if you give firearms to farmers so then the farmer basically has to kill the elephant and it's not that easy to kill an elephant and if you shoot an elephant and injure that elephant that leads to that elephant becoming much more aggressive towards people and in fact a lot of the what are called killer elephants 
are made by shooting at elephants and injuring them. So giving firearms to people, I think, is not a good thing under any circumstances because they will also be used against elephants, but also for poaching other animals and also in conflict between people and people. So I think that is uh, something uh, very dangerous to do. Exactly. And uh, I will take this as the last question. And uh, I'm getting some messages that uh, the discussion is really interesting. So even though we could not, uh, we, we hardly heard the initial part of the presentation and it was disturbed, but discussion has become, I think, full of interest. So uh, the last question, um, what is your view on having crossing corridors for elephants and other animals while blocking their movements in the fences area? Fenced areas, actually, fenced areas, particularly to prevent rail deaths. Um, so the, I'm not sure I quite understood the question. Could you repeat it, please? Yeah. Uh, what is your view on having crossing corridors for elephants and other animals while blocking their movements in the fen fenced areas? So that's the usual thing, okay. I think. Yeah. Right. No, that is, that is very good and that is something that needs to be done. But the point is, we have to design those corridors based on what the elephants do. That's where we go wrong. So if we just put up a fence and then uh, try to divert elephants to some corridor that we locate just out of the blue, the elephant will probably not use that corridor. He will probably break the fence and go where he wants. But if we actually track the elephants, uh, you can put radio collars on them and track them and you can get that data. Today, that's, I mean, very uh, doable. And if you use that information and you know that elephants cross this road at this point or cross this railway track at this point, then you can put a fence along that corridor. And then it is very, un the elephant will continue to use it and you can prevent sudden crossing by other animal, other elephants on in other areas. So it, if you actually get the information on elephants, then yes, then you can design such corridors and they will be successful. But if you just think uh, this is a good place for a corridor, then whether it will work or not, it's just a uh, hit or miss. Right, thank you very much. I think you are very well audible now, not as this before. So we missed that uh, chance. Uh, I guess some of the internet I think has picked up a little bit now. So I'm very sorry about this uh, mess today. There seems to be something very wrong with the internet, um, but now it seems to be working. Uh, unfortunately, uh, do, you have, do you have any uh, key message to deliver as the last point? Um, yes. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to talk to you today. And uh, um, I think actually the discussion that uh, subsequent to my uh, talk was actually one of the best discussions I've had in such uh, Zoom uh, presentations. So um, I'm very sorry about uh, not being able to do the presentation properly. But um, yeah, I think the important thing is that People like you all, I mean, uh, as doctors, as uh, the SLMA, you all have a lot of influence. And I would say um, if it is possible for you all to um, talk about this, think about this, and uh, maybe influence people to try and actually implement a scientific solution to this problem, I think uh, we can actually make a difference. Um, I could also make the action plan available to you if uh, you all are interested. Um, of course, it has not been um, sort of uh, adopted by the government, but uh, it was, of course, a committee appointed by HE. So, but if you are interested, I can uh, make the action plan available to you. Thank you. We are very much interested. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Fernando, one last thing. 
uh, I just want to ask if there are anyone who's willing to conduct the research or anything or the new inventions to try it out, uh, will it be possible to contact you and uh, conduct it or whom should we contact? Um, I'd be happy to talk to anybody who wants to discuss anything. But if you actually think that you have produced something, there are uh, you probably should talk to the wildlife conservation department. And they also have a number of programs with the uh, inventors forum and uh, things like that. So the wildlife department would be the people to talk to. Right, thank you very much. Uh, there, are, there are a few, uh, I, will, I will read out a few uh, comments. Thank you very much. Uh, we must appreciate his understanding about human uh, uh, humans that, he, uh, that I did not hear from many conservationists. And another one tells, uh, give me a second. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Appreciate your dedication and commitment in the conservation field. Uh, Dr. Prithviraj Pandu, I echo all these uh, sentiments and uh, all these uh, appreciations that have been showered on you. And thank you very much for joining us uh, despite all these issues. And I know that you joined from Tizamara and uh, this became a we came uh, something to think again uh, by us as well. So when in future, when we are having sessions like this, we would be having some backups and we would be more thoughtful about uh, conducting these sessions. Thank you very much for reminding that because we should not uh, disturb your usual uh, routine, but uh, we always would uh, happy to uh, go with that. And, uh, to share your knowledge, share research person's knowledge among our members. Thank you very much, Sajit. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Fernando, for that excellent presentation. Uh, despite all the difficulties, uh, we hope to uh, contact you again uh, for another presentation in future. And on behalf of SLMA, uh, thank you, uh, Padma Madam for giving us the chance and keeping the trust uh, on us, the SLMA Young Forum, uh, to conduct uh, these sessions. Thank you.